Okay. Um, hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Harry Progress. I'm a junior from NYU Shanghai, majoring in global China studies and social science with a focus in uh, politics. Um, with me moderating today's conversation um, is JJ Briscoe. JJ? Hello, yes, I'm JJ Briscoe. Currently, I am a sophomore in the Global Liberal Studies program. And um, I'm not sure if I caught, if Harry mentioned this, but I am also on the DC, um, NYU DC campus and the Global Leadership Program. And I'm excited to start this chat. So, from the Capitol today, we're having a conversation. It's our honor to have a conversation with Mr. Earl Carr. He received his undergraduate degree from the College of William and Mary. Um, majoring in international relations. He studied abroad in China, Taiwan, and Japan uh, at Beijing Normal University, Suzhou University, Ta Taipei Language Institute, and the International Christian University, Tokyo, Japan, before obtaining his master's degree in international affairs from American University. Earl's published work and citations have appeared in the McKinsey Quarterly, uh, um, South China Morning Post, and he's, he's been on the cover of the Financial Planning Magazine. Mr. Carr has been interviewed on Sinovision TV, NYU Global Citizen, uh, The China Daily, Jiefang Daily, etc. Outside of work, Mr. Carr is inv involved in the Council on Foreign Relations and is a member of the National Committee on the United States-China Relations and a fellow of the International Career Advancement Program. So today, um, we want to talk about basically the uh, overall uh, relationship between the US and China, the world's most important bilateral relationship, and compare uh, its grand strategies. So for the first question that we wanted to ask you, Mr. Carr, um, uh, we wanted to talk about the ability of the U.S. to have continuity in its foreign relations um, and have a grand strategy with regards to um, its relationship with uh, China, given its current like uh, domestic politics uh, and given the fact that it operates within a, a democratic system. Great. Well, first and foremost, Harry. Thank you so much for that very kind introduction. And it's a truly a pleasure and honor to be here with you as well as with JJ Briscoe. A special thank you to uh, Thomas McIntyre, uh, the director of the program for inviting me as well as Polly Turgeon for all of your, your, your great uh, work in organizing and bringing this together. Um, and it, I'm delighted to also be uh, an adjunct instructor at NYU Center for Global Affairs. Uh, it's a great question, Harry. And I think it's, it's so critically important that whenever we talk about China and Chinese foreign policy, um, particularly as it pertains to the, to the US uh, and as well as US foreign policy to China, um, to put things in context uh, when, we, when we talk about grand strategy. Um, so China has always looked at parity with the United States um, as a form of legitimacy with the, the, for the Chinese uh, Communist Party, as well as with China's own modernization efforts. Uh, we saw this parity, particularly in the 1960s, with um, China striving to be a nuclear power on par with the United States. We saw this in the 1980s with China's uh, uh, desire and accession into the, to the, um, the World Trade Organization. Uh, and we're seeing this play out today uh, in, the, in the realm of AI, artificial intelligence and, and, and patents. Um, just to put things in perspective, the United States um, throughout its evolution of inventions, just look at inventions, um, has put out roughly about 30,000 patents for inventions. China right now has put out about 78,000. Um, so it's important to understand the evolution of both competition as well as um, cooperation in the United States-China relationship as it pertains to overall grand strategy. And so I think you know within that context, you know, China, when you, when you think about its grand strategy currently, it really strives to be better recognized on the world stage. And that's a really important demarcation from where it historically was. If you look at policy under uh, Deng Xiaoping, it was kind of 
you know, go, go slow, you know, kind of, you know, focus more on building your power. Um, President Xi it has really made it very important, has made a, a really important shift that China wants to be perceived as a global power. And it also wants to perceive its global reach and its, and, its, and its global status as being able to kind of roll back America's influence, first and foremost, primarily in the periphery of East Asia. That's its first, first priority, um, to solidify um, kind of China's influence, first and foremost, within its borders around you know, the 14 countries that, that, it, that it, it borders, and then be able to protect better, project better power within Southeast Asia, particularly in, in the countries south of, of ASEAN. And now you're also trying, you're, you're seeing that grand strategy play out in other places like China having um, military bases for the first time in Djibouti. Um, and, and if you look at the writings on the wall, there will be more military bases in the future. So you're seeing the ability of China to project both soft power as what Joseph Nye called it, as well as hard power, what CSIS will call sharp power, uh, the ability to be able to target countries or companies um, that are not that, uh, supportive of their foreign policy in a very, you know, put a lot of significant pressure, whether that be sanctions, whether that be boycotting uh, goods and services like we saw with H&M in, uh, in, uh, in, in China when, you know, they, they issued a statement on Xinjiang. So I think with respect to China's uh, you know, grand strategy. I think it's really important that we understand also that the importance of how domestic politics plays into that grand strategy. You know, President Xi uh, wants to leave a very important legacy uh, within that grand strategy that talked of um, is the Belt and Road Initiative, um, which is which is a enshrined in China's constitution. B, you know, this this really wants you know she wants this to be an important part of his legacy. And so when we when we think about grand strategy with China, it's 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 kind of multiple a multi multi pronged strategy composed of both a domestic um, politics, which is which is important factor that is driving that, two China's global ambitions, um, and then three being able to like I said be in line with a legacy that she wants to leave. Um, so I would say those three primary points. Uh, you're on mute, Harry. So do you think that the U thank you. So do you think that the U.S.'s inability um, to have like a, uh, or would you think? Do you think that the U.S. currently does not have a grand strategy that matches the like that matches the current demands of the times? Great, great question. So when when we with respect with respect to U.S. grand strategy. I think it's a lot harder because when you look at U.S. politics, you know our our elected leaders. Uh, when you look at the Biden administration, you know he's elected for a term of you know four years, uh, and and if he gets reelected, you know maximum of eight years. You know with respect to um, China uh, and, and and the Chinese leadership, essentially, you know she was able to change President Xi was able to change the term limits, so they have a much longer time horizon. You know, they are able to project in and have a grand strategy that really is able to to go a lot further than, you know, kind of, you know, four or eight years. And so, you know, it's important to understand that dynamic. Uh, that being said, um, if you look at the the president, she uh, and, and the, you know, the Biden and she meeting that took place about less than 48 hours ago, um, you know, Jake Sullivan, the national security uh, you know, advisor, director made a very important comment. He said, if, you know, we spent a whole year when the Biden, when Biden first got elected, speaking with partners and allies in the region, in particular, South Korea, in particular, Japan, um, engaging with Taiwan, as well as Europe, to be able to be able to craft and engage a multilateral strategy vis-a-vis -vis China. So that when they went into negotiations 48 hours ago, they went in with the maximum amount of leverage, in addition, coupled with the, the recently passed uh, infrastructure bill, which is able to give you know, Biden a bit more um, you know, strength and leverage uh, politically at home. Um, so I think that you know, that's really important when you look at grand strategies that the United States, the United States is trying to focus their, what we call grand strategy by focusing on, on a long-term focused um, strategy on China. That was one of the primary reasons why they withdrew 
from Afghanistan. The, preve the, the prevailing um, you know, consensus was that the United States foreign policy was too spread thin. We were in Afghanistan, we were in multiple countries and in order to have a more focused approach on China, we need to more consolidate our resources vis-a-vis um, -vis China. And so uh, I think that those are some very critical components when we think of a grand strategy, uh, US grand strategies towards China. Got it. I guess the next question I had um, with regards to this um, Afghanistan question and multilateral approach to uh, dealing with China, um, we see how uh, China is building its own multilateral network through um, BRI as well. Um, and it's seeping in um, different organizations with its relationship with the ASEAN as well. Um, do you think that the U.S. Um, the U.S. still has um, its prevailing predominant role as like uh, a unipolar entity um, to maintain its leverage with these relationships? And do you think Build Back Better as the Build Back Better world program that Biden uh, ran on and came up early in COVID, but hasn't really manifested itself. Do you think that will manifest itself sometime in the future? Great, great question, Harry. Um, so with respect to this multilateral approach, one thing that um, I, I did not mention, um, the, the Jake Sullivan was very proud to announce that, you know, the United States engaged ASEAN for the first time in over four years, um, because they, they realized that in order to have a more effective policy vis-a-vis -vis China, they, we need to be better engaged in Southeast Asia. And so that was also a very, very important centerpiece of, of, of engagement in terms of that, that, that grand strategy vis-a-vis -vis China. Um, in terms of you know, you know, pull, you know, the, the Build Back Better um, in, in policy and, and how the United States is engaging China, it's, it's critically important that we understand first and foremost that, as I mentioned before, competition and cooperation have always defined the, the United States relationship with China. And, and President Biden made that um, you know, effectively very clear in the meeting um, you know, two days ago. Um, but it's also critically important that when we look at um, you know, where the United States is vis-a-vis -vis China, um, we are, and we need to be very honest, we are losing the race against China right now with respect to things like 5G, with respect to artificial intelligence. As my mentor tells me, the race is not lost yet, but we have to understand where we currently are in that race. Um, the United, the, China has devoted significant resources to things like artificial intelligence, research and development. Um, and, and, and we are kind of in many ways uh, I, I like to use a, you know, a, a basketball analogy. It's like, you know, we've been playing a lot more defense um, and, and, and China's been playing a lot more offense and, and the United States doesn't play defense well. Um, and so it's really important that we understand that dynamic currently in, in, in kind of US-China relations. Another important component um, that, that we haven't really touched upon is that, you know, as it reflects and as it pertains to our policy vis-a-vis -vis China, we need to do a lot more with respect to immigration policy as in particularly Chinese students. Um, our, there were about 373,000 Chinese students that studied in the United States last year. There were in that same period, 2020, there were roughly about under 10,000 American students that were studying in China. That is a woeful disparity. Uh, and that, that needs to be corrected. And that number, American students have actually, studying abroad in, in China have actually, that number has been declining. And so it's really important that as we think through policies to better promote a more effective uh, engagement with China, I, I think it really starts with some you know, practical and important immigration policy to really encourage more Chinese students to study uh, in the United States, engineers, and in a variety of different disciplines because that helps both the United States and China. Many, if you look at the number of inventions in Silicon Valley, Valley many of these came from immigrants who, who came from China um, um, that, that then often go back to China and work. So this is in many ways, in my mind, this is a win-win situation. Another important part of our strategy that we have to really focus on is that fundamentally decoupling the United States economy from China is would be absolutely catastrophic for both the United States economy 
and China's economy. Um, and so we have to understand that with all of this rate, you know, uh, you know, all of you know the tensions of, of the last four years with a trade war. The reality is that consumers were really hurt from that. Um, you know, uh, nonprofit organizations were hurt, uh, businesses were hurt, entrepreneurs were hurt from that. So it's so important that we need to get this relationship right with China um, on multiple levels. And there's only when you look at the two largest economies in the world, the United States and China, um, it is so important that we cooperate and work to ensure that our economies are healthy, we're promoting um, trade between the economies, but we're also promoting that the fact that any kind of military conflict, either in the South China Sea or in Taiwan would be once again, absolutely catastrophic. And we have to ensure it and, uh, that, that, that that by, by any means does not happen. Lastly, I just wanted to ask from my, uh, from my end, um, about quad, the quad um, and if outside of ASEAN and the US's relationship with um, Europe, for example, um, how successful has the quad been in de-escalating uh, tensions with uh, uh, China? Great question. Um, I don't think the quad has been very effective in de-escalating relations with with China, but it's symbolic. So when you look at the Quad, it's it's a kind of informal um, kind of relationship between the United States, uh, the, the United Kingdom, um, Australia, Japan, and, and India. And so uh, it's it's symbolic on on many levels. Uh, one, it's this recognition that in order to engage China effectively you need to have partners and allies in the region and you need to have a multilateral approach. You cannot engage China bilaterally. You can't win China one-on-one. -on -one. And the United, States, the, the United States engagement with Quad was a recognition of that fact, number one. Number two, the, the Quad, as I mentioned, is symbolic because it engages some of our strongest partners uh, and allies such as Japan, but it also engages um, you know, strategic relations with, with, with nations like India, which shares a border with China. And it's this notion that India has to understand and recognize that as it has, you know, border skirmishes with, with, with China, it needs to also engage other like-minded democracies to be able to have a more coordinated and targeted approach vis-a-vis -vis China. So the Quad, like I said, it, it's not going to be some kind of military, um, you know, um, multilateral institutions similar to NATO, where, which is a very clear and defined military alliance between the United States and Europe, but it is symbolic for what it could develop into. So um, once again, to answer your question, I, I wouldn't say that it has de-escalated um, <laughs> um, relations with, with China. In many ways, it, it, it has caused further tensions because China looks at the Quad as really aimed at, at China um, and trying to circumvent and, and prevent its rise or, or or kind of um, Im impact its, its uh, circumvent its influence in many ways, um, but it is very symbolic. Um, so next we are gonna discuss about that meeting, but I feel like we really hit on, you know, some key points of the meeting that Biden and she had just, as you mentioned, um, less than 40 hours ago. Was there anything else about that um, summit that you think is definitely worth bring, bringing to light? Yeah, uh, great, great question, uh, JJ. And, and I think it's important that one of the quintessential takeaways from the, the meeting between pres the, the virtual meeting between President Xi and President Biden was their comments on Taiwan. And if you compared their comments, put them together, you know, if you looked at the Chinese version and you looked at the English version, vastly different. You know, the Chinese, the, the Biden made it very clear that the United States is committed to the relationship to Taiwan in line with the 1979 um, Relations Act, which, which it hears the United States um, sh will be required to support Taiwan. Now it makes it very clear. It, it's important to know uh, the Taiwan, the 1979 Taiwan Relations Act does not commit the United does not commit the United States to providing American troops, but it does say support with respect to military arms. Uh, hence, you know, there is a annual military package that is provided to Taiwan every year. But if you look at the Chinese version 
of what the statements on Taiwan were. Essentially, it was the United States should not play with fire. And so what, 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 when you look at the two statements, I think you're, what you find within the Chinese statement is a growing frustration vis-a-vis -vis Taiwan in the sense that China believes that the United States in supporting Taiwan has emboldened Taiwan in many different ways in terms of um, maybe having more, more of a pro-independence kind of stance. But more importantly, it's the fact that the United States has really been able to internationalize the case for Taiwan, particularly with its, and bring support, particularly for, with its allies like Japan and, uh, and South Korea and, and others. Um, what the statement does not also acknowledge is the huge important um, role that Taiwan has played in, in, in bringing its case internationally and engaging with other like-minded um, partners. You saw a group of um, senators just recently uh, travel to Taiwan, much to the ire of Beijing. You're also starting to see other European countries reach out and, and establish stronger econo economic ties with Taiwan. Um, and so Beijing's strategy of trying to isolate um, Taiwan in many ways, there, there's a growing frustration in, 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 in kind of how the United States has engaged and really promoted and supported Taiwan. And I think that's where, you know, I, I think part of uh, an important part of the, the call, uh, the, the, the virtual meeting 48 hours ago was to kind of ratchet down tensions uh, which were very different from the meeting what we saw in Anchorage, you know, several months ago, which was a lot more uh, abrasive. Um, but I think that, you know, you saw very clearly the United States being able to assert um, some core fundamental differences in our foreign policy vis-a-vis -vis Taiwan. And you saw from President Xi's response, you know, Taiwan is very important um, to, to its foreign policy. Yeah, and something that's interesting is looking at those remarks that came from um, the United States and or, sorry, um, and China. I think one of the consensus that both sides had is that they wanted to continue talks, and they believe that um, these talks are already just being able to start up. You know, some of this foundation of mutual respect for each other. Um, and if there's anything you'd want to add on that, feel free. And then if not, we can move on to our kind of last question. No, JJ, I think you hit you you you, um, you 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 summarized it quite nicely. I think the you know I I you know I find that the the virtual meeting was a success, and I and I and I and I say that because you saw President Xi when he started the meeting saying referring to Biden as an old friend. You saw Biden starting the meeting also talking. To um, um, she, they they uh, they share a very out they share a very long history together. When 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 Biden was vice president, um, she was uh, uh, you know rising in the ranks, uh, and they they enjoyed a very good cordial relationship. So I think what's important is that they build on you know it's it's symbolic to be able to sit down, look at someone across from from their table, be able to look someone in the eye, uh, and, and talk frankly about areas of both you know, where we can cooperate on, but also have a frank and honest and open discussion on where we disagree in terms of foreign policy, whether that be human rights, um, which was discussed about, uh, also um, on where the origins of COVID came, you know, COVID came from, you know, in this almost four hour meeting, you know, it's very important that people in the United States, society, uh, the, the, you know, people in China see our leaders at the highest level talking with each other. That's important. Uh, it sets the tone for so many issues, um, both, but, but also for civil society and a variety of other, you know, business, civil society, you name it. So I think that this was a very important step and I hope we can continue to build on this, these types of engagement and communication. And then um, one final thing that I wanted to kind of ask and see what you, um, what you had to say is that also recently in the news, um, the China's Communist Party has, um, let me just make sure I get this right, um, the party's leadership created a resolution and it's you know only the third since its founding. Um, and that resolution was to bring Xi Jinping to that status um, of a couple other not notable um, 
people from the Communist Party, such as Mao Zedong. I tried to pronounce that right. Um, and what do you yeah. think that means for the relationships going forward, knowing that he has been brought up to this status um, as being a, one of the three leaders so far of this party, a major leader? Absolutely. I, I think there, there are three things that I take away. Um, President Xi has been able to consolidate power in China much faster than, than many had, had imagined. And he did it in three different ways. Number one, he implemented a very effective kind of anti-corruption campaign, um, which was in many ways, um, you know, very popular to, um, you know, China and the, and the broader populace because, you know, uh, you know, he wants to root out corruption. But at the same time, he also had a dual purpose of trying to root out people who were not loyal to his 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 kind of um, you know policies, um, and so that that you know that was one of the first things he did when he came into power. Um, he's also been able to be very effective in promoting his ideology, and here this is where where ideology plays a very important role. If you look at you know the previous leaders of China, whether that be you know Hu Jintao. Um, or, or, or Jiang Zemin, you know, Jiang Zemin, you know, his, uh, in Chinese, they call it Sangha Dai Biao, the three represents thoughts was very important part of his foreign policy. When we look at Xi, President Xi, you know, it's, you know, his notion of the Chinese dream, right? What, what does that mean for the, 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 the future of, of, of China's, um, you know, society? And I think that that is something that he really wants to be known and, and really make a, a legacy of the fact that, you know, things like the China Dream, things like um, the Belt and Road uh, Initiative, which is enshrined in China's constitution. Um, the fact that by 2050, you know, he wants China to be, you know, a, a developed uh, economy on par with other developed nations. You know, he has a lot of these, um, you know, aspirations, which have in many ways, because he's been so effective at consolidating power, he is now being regarded as one of these, you know, leaders on par with Mao Zedong and, 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 and others like Deng Xiaoping. Um, but another important component of that is the fact that when you, when you look at President Xi, the fact that he was able to get effective you know, term limits um, taken away. So he is essentially you know, um, president for life. Um, that, that's very rare because when Mao, Mao Zedong and also Deng Xiaoping you know, when they, they, they put in place guardrails so that, you know, no one person would be able to consolidate, you know, so much power for, for an extended period of time. President Xi has redefined that power structure. And so I think it's really important that, you know, the fact that he can essentially be, I mean, he does have to be approved and, 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 you know, he, he essentially has to go through a process, but everyone knows no one's going to, you know, he, he's going it, to, it's kind of like a rubber stamp, like no one's going to vote against him. Um, and so I think that, that for his legacy, um, you know, he will, he will be regarded as a, as a very important um, central figure in, in uh, uh, China politics for, 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 for some time. I did want to ask about the parallels. Um, one, of the, one of the things you noted for C's success was this notion of his promotion of a an ideology or the Zhongguomengxiang, the, the Chinese dream. Um, what are the parallels between uh, like that notion, um, Chinese ex uh, ex exceptionalism and the American dream and American exceptionalism? Um, can we, could, could you help us unpack that? Absolutely. And once again, great, great questions from, from, from both of you, um, JJ and, and Harry. Um, I think that, you know, the American dream is something that many Chinese could relate to. Um, you know, when you think of, you know, when you start a family, you want to, you know, you want to better provide for your family. You want to at some time own a home, own a car, provide a better education to your family. Um, and this American dream has been um, a, an important hallmark of uh, what we call, you know, which is kind of in line with, you know, what American exceptionalism and 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 this notion of um, soft power that Joseph Nye at Harvard coined. Uh, and China has been able, in the United States, has been very effective at promoting um, American 
culture abroad with Hollywood, uh, American uh, entrepreneurs and American businesses and products um, being, you know, a very strong economy and having a very strong civil society and, and being and having a very strong, um, you know, democrat democratic institutions. Uh, and so I think when China thought of its own dream or the China dream, uh, in many ways, it's trying to once again, you trying to strive for parity with the United States competing um, in, in having redefining that dream for Chinese citizens. You know, how do Chinese citizens um, better uh, accrue a level of wealth where they can better own um, property, better support their families? And, and it's important to understand the context, right? You have China with 1.4 billion people. You've seen, you know, so many people lifted out of poverty within the last two decades. You know, historically, uh, when you look at China's economy, what we call the tier one cities, Beijing, Shanghai, um, Hong Kong, like these cities have really been the drivers of growth. But now what you're seeing is, you know, these for the last 10 years, tier two cities, Sichuan, Chongqing, uh, and other cities are, have been actually growing faster for the last 10 years than these tier one cities. And so there's this implicit, um, you know, notion that the Chinese government um, has kind of said, look, we are we need to deliver on providing an a, you know an important foundation of grow economic growth so that you know um, people and individuals see an improved uh, lifestyle standard of living, um, and that's important for for China's growth. Now, if that stops, right? If the if the Chinese government can't deliver on on that economic growth, you you are going to see unrest in China. And we've seen that, um, you know, at several times throughout China's history. Uh, you've also seen it in different parts of rural areas where that growth has not been that growth has not been delivered on. And so the Chinese government is very, very, you know, the the, the Beijing understands that it needs to be able to continue to guarantee a foundation of that growth. Um, and if it doesn't, it, it its own survival as as a political party could be in jeopardy. So. Those are those are things that are really important when you understand the the, the China or Zhongguo Meng, as you said, the Chinese dream versus the American dream. Thank you so much for that uh, that answer. It's been a great conversation. Do you have anything, um, JJ? Um, I actually did have one more question, and feel free to not answer it if you don't want to. Um, but um, one of the things that has been brought up and one of the things that was speculated that they would talk about during the um, meeting between Biden and Xi was that some people thought maybe she would invite Biden to the Beijing Winter Olympics. Um, and I know that a lot of human rights um, advocates do not want him to go because of the uh, Uyghur internment camps. So would you have an opinion on that? Should America ban the Olympics? Should Biden go? What would, would do you have a stance on that? Great, once again, great question. You know, so Nancy Pelosi, Speaker of the House, has made it very clear that the United States should not participate in the Beijing Olympics. Um, a number, as you as you stated, a number of human rights groups uh, and other organizations that support Xinjiang have also advocated boycotting the Olympics. And it's it's in many ways it reflects a level of uh, democratic discourse in our society to be able to have different groups advocate. Uh, and have that conversation. You know, if they, they feel strongly that the United States should should not um, participate in that in in the Olympics, and and they have that that is their right to be able to to demand that and advocate for that. Um, I think the the more important thing that I think is so critically important that we not forget is that when the United States and China cannot agree on certain issues like human rights, the issue of Xinjiang, what, what's going on with Uyghurs what's going on, uh, where COVID came from. It's so important that we understand that that should not preclude us from trying and striving to find common ground on other very important transnational issues, such as um, uh, the environment. You know, we haven't even talked about that yet. You know, uh, engaging US companies with clean energy technology with China. Um, when you look at the, um, the, the, the environmental, huge environmental issues that China is facing with the use of coal um, and even looking at the air pollution. Um, many people forget that, you know, there's, there's air pollution that comes from, from the winds from parts of China that goes to actually parts of California. 
So environmental issues are directly in China directly impact the United States. I was speaking to an investor the other day and he was he was arguing, you know, we should not be investing in China's economy at all. Why, why when we look at issues of human rights, like the issue of Xinjiang, the issues of Hong Kong, why, why are we the United States investing in China? And I said to him, well, look, what about clean energy technologies and, and, and you know, American businesses being able to invest in China's environmental ecosystem, which is a win-win situation for both the United States and China. And I'll give one great example. There's a fund called the, Grain, the Crane Shares um, ETF, um, decarbonization ETF. It has over 900 million in assets, primarily invested from by American investors. The fund is now up almost like 50% year to date. It's done extraordinarily well. And it invests in the decarbonization footprint of the People's Republic of China. Now that's good for not just China and its regional neighbors, but it's good for our economies as well. So I try to help people who, who have maybe maybe not, a, a, you know, who, who have a very misguided view on decoupling because you, we can't fundamentally, you know, decouple all of, you know, all, you know, our economies together. So just use that example, one clear example of how the United States and China can partner on, on, on important transnational issues, even when we cannot degree, agree on, on important human rights issues like Beijing Olymp Olympics, et cetera. That was something I did really want to talk about, um, the COP26 or the environment as well. Um, I guess one major takeaway uh, that I wanted to ask about um, from the talk so far or from our conversation, um, yeah, considering decoupling should not be on the table, um, how do you envision the future relationship being, um, considering that the carry the, the we're still carrying over the trade war from um, Trump's administration to the current Biden administration, um, and what does that relationship look like? Yeah, great, great question, Harry. And I, and I think that when we look at the current you know inflection point in in, in U.S. China relations, um, you know Biden came into power um, having to prove that he was not going to continue the policies of President Obama vis-a-vis -vis China. Biden came in under enormous pressure to prove that he was not going to be soft vis-a-vis -vis China. It was, it, you know, if, the, if there was one thing that Republicans and Democrats were both united on, it was actually China policy. Uh, and so, you know, what, what, what's interesting now is that, it, and, and how that's playing out now is that in many ways, many, many, strategic analysts argue that Biden does not have the strategic political capital at home to actually have softer relations on China, you know, in many different ways. And you, and you saw part of that in the, the first meeting at Anchorage. Um, this was a very different meeting, um, you know, two days ago. Uh, it was this growing recognition that, look, um, we need to be able to find a more constructive way to engage on transnational issues. And it was, it was interesting that Biden made an important point that China as a global power should not be engaging in the United States on these transnational issues um, as, as, as kind of like, oh, we'll, we'll, we'll engage on these issues if you do, if you do with, with preconditions, right? America is saying, look, if you, China, if you want to be viewed as a global power, you should not be trying to negotiate and hedge. These are your response. You have certain responsibilities as, as a global power on issues um, in, their, in their four hour meeting. And they talked about things like uh, global cooperation on narcotics. Both the United States and China have a joint responsibility to focus on issues um, of, of you know, preventing international drugs from, from getting from, you know, into their economies and globally. Um, on climate change, uh, Secretary Kerry um, you know, made it very clear that um, they, they are committed to working with uh, China to be able to um, uh, improve carbon emissions, uh, working, uh, working to improve our environmental footprint in a variety of different ways. Um, and that's important both for civil society, for nonprofits, for the private sector. You know, it, we need to get better private sector technologies to be able to work more collaboratively with Chinese entities um, um, on, on climate change. 
Um, so I think that it's really important when we view the, the vast array of these international issues that, that climate change is, is one of those low hanging fruits that like what I call like those anchor issues that when all else, when all else fails, right? Like at least we can hang on to, to climate change as, as, as one of those anchor areas that, that help the United States and China. What about um, the, the supply chain issues that we're currently facing? Um, mm -hmm. Do you think that will have a major role um, in future relations as well? Absolutely. The supply chain issues are fundamental to both the United States and China. And once again, underscores uh, when, 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 there's a, when there's a global pandemic um, like COVID, how disruptive um, this can be for both the US economy and, and China's economy. Um, the United States recognized when COVID hit that there were certain things um, that they didn't have in their, in their supply chain arsenal, such as you know, masks. Um, you know, they, they had relied on, on China for, for, for so long producing so, so much of these core essentials. So it was really a wake up call for many policymakers who, who said, look, we, we cannot have this happen again, where we are, you know, so there, there are certain core, uh, another uh, clear example is uh, computer chips um, in, in, in our semiconductor, semiconductor chips, you know, vast majority of those are produced in, in Taiwan. Um, and so it really was a wake up call on what are certain core national security industries that the United States maybe should think about, um, you know, producing here in the United States um, um, so that we don't, you know, you know, encounter this situation again. Um, the other the other point, important point that I had wanted to mention um, is that when you look at you know, the United States and China with respect to global supply chains, they're really shifting, right? So a lot of American multinational companies that had produced in China are now waking up to the fact that, wow, you know, if we put all of our eggs in one basket in China and a China's economy shuts down, that has a huge impact on our global operations. So now you're seeing what's called the China plus one model where companies are reducing their, um, you know, kind of uh, engagement or, or footprint in China and, you, and, and, and having and relocating factories to countries like Vietnam, like Thailand, like Indonesia, because they don't want to have that level of sustain, you know, that huge risk in China should something happen to, to China's economy. Um, and so you're seeing a, a significant global supply chain shift in China in line with the fact that the cost of living in China is increasing, right? Factory workers are trying to um, find where where are there cheaper ways to produce quality, uh, which with that still has relatively good infrastructure, et cetera. So the whole ecosystem of global supply chains is radically changing right now. Well. I think that I think we can kind of start wrapping this up. Was there anything else that you would like to share, um, or make sure that you uh, head on? <laughs> I don't know how else to phrase it. No, no worries. And thank you. I just want to say thank you, JJ. Thank you, Harry. Um, you know, I think one of my favorite quotes is from a man by the name of Wang Yangming, who was a, uh, a scholar of the Confucius classics uh, in the 18th century, and he said, "The only true knowledge." is knowledge which is engaged and aware of its consequences in action. And when I see bright students like yourself at NYU, it's a growing recognition that, you know, NYU is such a place where you can get knowledge, but more importantly, apply knowledge uh, in, your, in, in, your, in your professional careers, et cetera. So thank you so much for this great opportunity. Thank you. It was definitely very enjoying to be a, a part of this conversation, especially when it comes from someone who talks about this kind of material and what's going on so passionately like you do. Um, so I really was, I appreciate it. I feel very fortunate to have been able to um, host this along with Harry. Was there anything you wanted to share? Really learned a lot this morning. Thank you for um, spending the time. Uh, to geek out with us uh, over a critical issue um, for that will define um, 
the future of bilateral relations in our generation. Thank you. Thank you.